Okay, so bureaucracy. Uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this, um, one of the things I want to make sure that you understand is that um, bureaucracy is a really tough chapter for me to teach. Um, essentially, since October, I have been trying to figure out a way to teach bureaucracy. I've been reading all sorts of books, I've been watching all sorts of lectures, I've been asking other AP Gov teachers how do you teach bureaucracy, because the problem with bureaucracy is there are two choices. You can teach bureaucracy really broad, really general, very con conceptual sort of the ideas of bureaucracy and how it runs, or you can get very, very specific. You can give extensive examples, you can go into tiny little details, you can do all sorts of things. And the problem is, is that again, I'm teaching to a test and I don't know what's on the test. And so I'm crossing my fingers that there are big, broad ideas there might be something very specific. In fact, one of the things that freaks me out about this is that I think two years ago, on the AP test, there was a question that had a very specific detail about bureaucracy. And all of the AP government teachers were up in arms about it. They were really mad about it because they hadn't spent a lot of time talking about this one very specific concept, and so their kids didn't do very well on that piece of the FRQ. And so I'm scared because I don't know if I'm going to teach you the most or whatever you need to know. So this is what I'm saying about you need to not rely on me for this because I could spend four weeks just talking about the bureaucracy because we could go into so many specific details. I don't have time. I'm not even giving you full two weeks worth of in-class stuff. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a problem. By the way, I am going to teach you that tiny specific detail because I'm freaking out about it, but odds are probably good they're not going to bring it up because it was in the test two years ago. Maybe they will, um, but that's what we're doing on Wednesday. We're going to talk about that specific issue. So for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to stay very broad. Okay, so your book is a little bit more specific. It's going to give you some actual examples of some of these agencies. Um, I'm going to give you another book reading next week that is a little bit more of an example piece. Uh, I'm going to try and sprinkle in some examples for you. Um, I'm going to try and do my best. Okay. So before we get started, um, I'm going to tell you a little story about bureaucracy because a lot of people have this idea of what bureaucracy is. Some people might be like, I don't even know what bureaucracy is. I don't get it. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So here's the problem with bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is all of the office organization groups of people um, of the executive branch, also the legislative branch, essentially we consider just government, okay? There are a lot of decisions that are made up at the cabinet level, there are a lot of decisions that are made up at the very bottom level. All of that is bureaucracy, from the very bottom to the very top. Okay, so an example of bureaucracy in your everyday life. Two weeks ago, I filled out a voter registration form because I have moved since the last time I voted, and so I need to register in my district that I'm now voting in. Wisconsin doesn't do online voter registration, which is crazy to me, but whatever. Fill out my piece of paper, I send it in to the county clerk's office, which is in Lake Mills, and about two days later I get this very nice phone call from this woman who is the county clerk. She says to me, I'm really sorry, but I need you to come down to my office to hand me this piece of paper. And I was like, what? I sent the piece of paper to you. She's like, oh yeah, I have a piece of paper in my hands, but I need you to hand it to me. Essentially, there's a rule in Wisconsin that two weeks out from an, an election, which was last Tuesday, because the Supreme Court Justice's primary and a couple of other positions, I had, I had sent in my thing within that two-week period. And within that two-week period, she cannot process voter registration forms from the mail. She can only process the voter registration if I physically hand it to her. So what I had to do is go to the county clerk's office. She handed me the piece of paper back. I gave the piece of paper back to her, and then she could actually fill out my voter registration form. Okay, That's bureaucracy. It's why it gets such a bad rap in the world of government, because lots of people are like, no, I am not going to go all the way down to that office to hand you a piece of paper. And in fact, I didn't. Part of it is because I wasn't planning on voting in that last election. I had conferences, and I wasn't going to get back in time to vote. Second of all, I wasn't super interested because um, it's just a primary. Um, so I ended up just saying to her, hold on to my piece of paper. Then on Wednesday last week, she could go ahead and fill it out and use it because the two weeks had passed. 
Um, but that's bureaucracy. That's the idea of she works for the federal government. She has a regulation she has to abide by. She is explaining to me. I have to go down there and like work with the system. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Okay. So bureaucracy. What is bureaucracy? It is a large organization that is structured hierarchically to carry out specific functions. Okay, I'm gonna say that again because it has nothing to do with government right now. Okay, listen carefully. Bureaucracy, definition of bureaucracy is a large organization that is structured hierarchically to carry out specific, specific functions. Okay, so when we talk about bureaucracy, everyone always thinks government. It's not necessarily true. It could be a private company. Google has a bureaucracy. Apple has a bureaucracy. Um, I don't know. Red Robin has a bureaucracy. All of these private corporations have a bureaucracy. Why? Because I answer to someone above me, and they answer to someone above them, and they answer to someone above them, and ultimately we're going to go all the way up the ladder to somebody who is top dog. That's a bureaucracy. So we have it in the public sphere, which is government, but we also have it in the private sphere, which is just simple business organizations. And so one of the things I want to make sure that you, you don't mess up on your FRQ is to say that bureaucracy is always government. It's not. It can be a private organization. It can be a private company. Obviously, in terms of our class, we are going to talk about the public domain of bureaucracy, which is government. In the public domain of bureaucracy, um, things are organized uh, where there's a leader. It trickles all the way down to somebody who works, you know, way down the chain. Um, they're there to serve citizens. But the main thing here that sets public apart from private is that they are not organized for profit. Okay, so a public bureaucracy, its intention isn't to try and make money off of you. It's not in, in, in interested in going ahead to do some of those things. So for instance, if I go to uh, the DMV to renew my license and it costs me $75, they're not making a profit off that $75. That $75 is going to go to paying for the DMV salary, worker salary, paying for the materials that it costs to print my license, paying for the paperwork, but no one's going to actually make more money off of that. Some CEO is going to get rich off of my license renewal form. Um, so there, that's a really big caveat um, to um, public versus private. Okay, we need to talk about some models of bureaucracy because when we talk about bureaucracy, it's not just intuitive that there's like one set you know, way to do things or, or how it's organized in one specific way. There are a number of models, and we're only going to go through three, but there are a lot of different models on how to organize bureaucracy. Um, first is the Weberian model. This was um, started by a man named Max Weber, who was a sociologist. Uh, obviously, a sociologist studies the social behavior of people, how they behave or interact in a, in a social world. And the Weberian model says that bureaucracy is to be rational, hierarchical organizations based on logical reasoning. So they should be rational, hierarchical organization based on, on logical reasoning. This is the idea that you should build your, your organized or your organization or your workers in a way that makes sense. So that you don't have to go around all sorts of different hoops to jump through or things like that. That it should just be logical. If it makes sense, it should stay. If it doesn't make sense, it should be changed. Okay? Think of it in a very black and white way. Acquisitive model is a type of bureaucracy where those at the very top are constantly trying to gain more money, more staff, more power. So it's not necessarily interested in helping you, the little guy. It's how can I make more money? How can I have more staff? How can I have more power? And it's very focused on people who are at the top. And then a monopolistic model. 
this is the idea of taking a look at bureaucracy just like monopoly businesses. The idea here is that when there's a lack of competition, this will lead to inefficient and costly operations. So a mono monopolistic model is going to um, compare bureaucracies to a monopoly business. It's the idea that is this bureaucracy competing for the best and most efficient and best price for you? So obviously when we talk about public bureaucracy, there isn't a lot of competition. I can't go somewhere else to get my voter registration taken care of. I have to go and do whatever they need me to do. Now, because that is the case, does that make this bureaucracy less efficient? Maybe. The idea here is that nobody else is going to buy up their business, so they can go ahead and do what they want. As far as bureaucracies, um, our bureaucracy compared to others, the U.S. federal bureaucracy is one of the largest, most extensive, most independent bureaucracies of any developed nation. We have a, a bureaucracy that works on its own, typically, uh, with help from us, but it operates every single day. And we trust that it will operate every single day. This is where I want you to take a, a look at your life and think about how often you interact with bureaucracy. Lots of people sort of think, well, you know, I only go to renew my license every few years and I'm not a voter and blah, blah, blah. You actually interact with bureaucracy on a daily basis. When you go and get your mail, you've interacted with bureaucracy. When you show up to school, you've interacted with bureaucracy. When you get pulled over, you're interacting with bureaucracy. When you need an um, address change form, when you fill out federal financial aid forms, when you apply to universities, all of those things are part of the bureaucracy. It's one of those concepts that's so hard to teach because you actually use it every single day, you just don't know that you do. And that's the way it ought to be. We want you to not feel like bureaucracy is down your throat all the time. We want it to sort of feel comfortable to you. And so the fact that you don't always recognize it is almost a good thing. But what I do need you to understand is that in other countries, in other nations, the things that you have are not always common to them. So things like postal work. Sometimes in some nations, that's not a federal organization. We'll call it a government corporation here in a minute. Uh, but sometimes it's all private. It's all privately owned. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's just like buying a cell phone. Sometimes you have to figure out who's going to give you the best price and you have to make sure that you're making a good financial decision. I don't have to think about that when I go to the post office because it's not there to make a profit. It's going to always try to keep it low and efficient for me. Okay, size of bureaucracy. In 1789, when our government started, we have about 50 employees running the country. Uh, we had three specific departments. We had a um, state department. It had nine employees. We had a war department. It had two employees. And we had a treasury department that had 39 employees. Just kind of interesting if you look at that just in and of itself. Um, we also had the Office of the Attorney General. So we had about 50 employees uh, running the country. Currently, we have about 2.7 million civilian federal employees, and that is excluding the military. Uh, we have an extensive federal government. Um, obviously, we are very different than the way we looked in 1789. So there is, you know, obviously some growth needed. Our government would be able to run on 50 employees, that's for sure. But this is where the controversy lies. It is becoming a political issue, bureaucracy, um, because lots of people say we shouldn't have this many people in bureaucracy, that we should be very careful about the size that we grow our bureaucracy to. But some people on the other side say, no, we need it to be this big because we have all of these things that people need help with, that our government interacts with them, that if we don't, we won't be efficient. We won't get it done and people will become more and more frustrated and confused with the process. Now, in that political sphere, we have seen some um, changes. We've seen private subcontractors um, start to become more prevalent, especially in the last decade. 
So this is where the government will hire an already established private company to do something for them. Um, we often see this a lot in the military or security. Rather than making an entire department, hiring people, figuring it all out, they just hire a security company that's already in place to go ahead and do things for them as in a government entity. We also see a lot more state and local government employees. This is the idea that if bureaucracy is really supposed to be most efficient, the bulk of those employees should be at the local level. That if we have almost half of our federal employees sitting in Washington, D.C., they're not necessarily helping the everyday people as much as they should be. Um, and you, you should know that out of all of our bureaucracy, there's a very small proportion of them that actually work in Washington, D.C. anymore. Okay, organization of the federal bureaucracy. Our federal bureaucracy is um, divided into four structures. Okay, I'm going to go through four of the structures, then we're going to talk about the first one. Four structures. First one is the cabinet. Second one is independent executive agencies. Third is independent regulatory agencies. And fourth is government corporations. So essentially, we can divide every piece of bureaucracy in the federal level into one of these four groups. I'll say them again. Cabinet, independent executive agencies, independent regulatory agencies, and government corporations. Okay, cabinet departments. There are 15 cabinet departments. We call these line organizations. Why? Because they have a direct line to the president. Who is the boss of the department? Our cabinet department, the president. Uh, no one, they don't answer to anyone else other than the president. Um, this means that they're some of the most powerful departments in our federal bureaucracy. It means they're some of the largest departments in our federal bureaucracy because they have a lot to do. They have a lot to answer to. Um, and so uh, they're the kind of the first piece of the bureaucracy as you come down from the president. Next is an independent executive agencies, um, and we consider independent ex executive or agencies. Um, sometimes this gets confusing because executive agencies and regulatory agencies are often intermingled. For instance, the Environmental Protection Agency is considered an independent executive agency because they report to the president and they're outside of the cabinet, but they are also part of a regulatory agency. I hope that makes sense. I'll say that again. The Environmental Protection Agency is an independent executive agency, but they are also a regulatory agency. Um, they answer to the president, they're outside of the cabinet, and then there is a piece of them, uh, of their organization, that um, puts into place rules and regulations. So an independent regulatory agency um, has the purpose to regulate, to put into rules, uh, put into place rules and regulations that have been decided. Um, a lot of this is things like um, inspections and making sure that things are up to code and, and all of those things. Sometimes in independent regulatory agencies, we have a concept called agency capture. And I really want to make sure that you understand what agency capture is. Um, agency capture is where, I'm going to make sure I've got this word for word, the act by which an industry being regulated by a government organization or agency gains direct or indirect control over agency personnel and decision makers. Okay, agency capture the act by which an industry being regulated by a government agency gains direct or indirect control over the agency personnel and decision makers. I'm going to give you an example of agency capture so that you've got one. One of the best known um, pieces of agency capture is the oil spill with BP. Um, so BP is a large private organization, uh, their gas oil um, organization, and they had a great deal of um, oil rigs in the, off the coast, southern coast um, in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't remember how long ago this was. I want to say it was like 2011, but I could be wrong. Um, one of those oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico started to leak. Um, it broke and it started to spew like gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of oil 
into the Gulf of Mexico, into the water. Big problem, right? Oil kills all sorts of wildlife, animals in the Gulf of Mexico. They can't get it under control for like two weeks. We sit and watch all of this oil being spewed into the ocean. There's nothing they can do. They can't figure out how to stop, how to cap the oil. Um, finally, they get, go ahead and find a way to go ahead and do that, but they've, they've dumped millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, and they've ultimately destroyed a great deal of the ecosystem there. Once this is all said and done, we step back and take a look at how did this happen? How did this oil rig break? How did we not have a way to fix it faster than a two-week issue? And what ends up coming out is that BP had captured a piece of the EPA. Because BP is such a big organization, they worked with the EPA on a daily basis. They've got EPA workers who are specifically sort of delegated to look at all of BP's issues, and that takes a ton of time. And so basically these people interact with BP all the time, every day, all day, um, looking at oil rigs, looking at processes, looking at transportation of oil, things like that. And so what had happened is that these EPA workers who had been working with BP um, had been captured. They'd actually been bought by the BP people to sort of fudge some things a little bit for them. So they didn't go and inspect these oil rigs. They didn't find a process to cap that oil um, because they had been told by BP that they didn't need to. They'd been captured. Um, and that's what we consider agency capture. When an industry is able to sort of control the people who regulate them, um, they're able to sort of get by with some things. Deregulation and re-regulation should be somewhat self-explanatory. Deregulation is the idea of taking out regulation. There are a lot of people in government that feel like we should be focusing on deregulation, getting out some of these silly rules and regulations. Re-regulation is the idea of either putting into place a regulation that used to be, or changing the regulation to fit the new standards or ideas. Um, and so we often have a lot of people who spend a great deal of time um, asking for more or you know, different regulation um, of some pieces. Last piece in the four structures of federal um, bureaucracy is government corporations. Government corporations are run as quasi-business enterprises. So the idea is that they look like a business, they act like a business, you may think they're a business, but they're actually not. They're funded, they're backed by the government. Two of the most popular here are obviously the U.S. Postal Service um, and Amtrak. The U.S. Postal Service is funded by the government, which means that the person who is in charge of the U.S. Postal Service... Two more minutes. Could I have Katie? Two more minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, U.S. Postal Service. You go to the Postal Service, right? You walk up to the counter, there's a cashier, you go get pop, like stamps, all of those things, right? It looks like a business. The thing is, is that it's just that there's not a CEO sitting in some cushy office making money off your stamp. The stamp is the price that it needs to be in order for them to break even. It's not there to make a ton of money. Um, also, all Postal Service workers are considered government employees. They have to go through a test. They have to... Um, they are essentially paid by the government in that sense. Um, Amtrak is the same thing. Um, you might not be as familiar with Amtrak because there's not a lot of Amtrak here. Um, on the East Coast, it's much more prevalent. It's a transit system, a train system. Um, and again, they're backed by the government, so they're not a private organization. Now, there is a lot of argument that these two things should become private organizations, that there's no need for the government to sort of monitor it anymore. Um, first, because the Postal Service, although they may look like they're, they're coming out even, they're actually taking loans from the government every year. So they're actually not making any money, they're losing money. Um, and part of that is because they've got competition now. UPS, FedEx are massive. And so there are a lot of people who will go to those organizations rather than to the Postal Service. And so they lose business in that. So there have been a number of changes that have been proposed. Uh, the idea of not having Saturday delivery. Um, anytime a stamp price goes up, uh, that's because they're trying to get some money there. Um, they've also been talking about not doing packages, uh, only doing paper mail. Um, Amtrak is the same way, although Amtrak had one of their best years last year. Anyone want to guess why? Why would Amtrak do well? 
what would cause someone to go to an Amtrak train rather than get in their car? Gas prices. Gas prices were some of the highest gas prices last year. Um, and so Amtrak did really well because we wanted to uh, save money. Now, will they do very well this year? Oh, I don't think so because gas prices are really cheap right now, uh, which means that most people will probably go there, uh, do their own private transportation rather than go to Amtrak. Okay, when we talk about the timeline of bureaucracy, um, one of the biggest bumps in the timeline is 9-11. After 9-11 happened, um, we were, it was one of the biggest issues. Um, bureaucracy looked really bad. Why? Because there were a lot of red flags. There were a lot of issues that could have been um, seen before the 9-11 attacks that were kind of swallowed up by the bureaucracy. This one bureaucratic um, agency noticed this one thing but didn't really think it was anything. And then this other bureaucratic agency saw this one thing but didn't really think it was that big of a deal. They didn't talk to each other, and so they didn't know that they both had different red flags. And so this terrorist attack happened, um, and it was a really well-planned out attack. So after 9-11, it became really obvious that we needed um, to have a better system so that our, our security agencies would be able to talk to each other in a better way. Um, and so in 2003, President George W. Bush uh, started the Department of Homeland Security. And essentially what he did is he just took already existing agencies and he put them together under the Homeland Security Agency so that they were kind of um, talking to each other in a better way. Uh, the second time we see challenges with the bureaucracy is anytime they deal with a natural disaster. Um, FEMA, which is probably the most important um, department or agency, I guess you could say, in uh, the world of natural disasters, is an exec a federal bureaucratic agency. And they are constantly struggling to deal with natural disasters. Part of it is because they don't always have the budget that they need to have. When a president wants to reallocate money, a lot of times they'll take it from FEMA because he's going to gamble and hope that there's not a huge natural disaster this year. Uh, sometimes that works out better than other years. Um, but the problem with bureaucracy is that there are a lot of offices that do a lot of different things. And so when we have a natural disaster, we have to make sure that they're talking to each other and providing assistance to everyone. And when they're not, we see really big problems. Um, so, you know, if there's medical care but no one's there to help clean up, or if there's medical care but no one's there to go get some people who are trapped in their homes, um, or if there's no medical care but, you know, everybody needs medical care, that's a bit of a problem. So they have to be able to sort of make that happen um, in a time of crisis, which can be really difficult. Okay, staffing bureaucracy. We've got two different types um, of staff in the bureaucracy. First is political appointees. Second is civil servants. Political appointees are kind of what it sounds like. These are people or positions that the president appoints a person for. Um, there are a lot of political appointee um, positions. Um, and the president's main job in the first few days of being president is to make sure that um, he has some good advisors and has named some people to those political appointee uh, positions. On the flip side are civil servants. Civil servants are people who um, are hired by the government um, and are working for the government but aren't necessarily appointed by anybody um, specifically. What's the difference? Uh, political appointees are kind of considered the aristocracy of the federal government, which is considered the higher ups. They also don't last very long. Um, the average length of a, of a political appointee in federal government is about three years. Um, they just don't find it to be, um, I mean, sometimes it just burns them out, but sometimes it's just not what they wanted. Civil servants, on the other hand, will spend their entire lives working for the federal bureaucracy. These are the kind of people who um, are really passionate about what they do. It's like your mailman who's been delivering mail for 60 years. That's a civil servant. He's super excited about what he does. He likes to serve his country, um, and he enjoys his work. I could be considered a civil servant. I work for a public school. I love what I do. I plan on doing this for the rest of my life. Um, that's the difference between me and a political appointee. There's also a little bit of difficulty in firing civil servants. I'm going to let your book describe that a little bit for you. Uh, partially because we're running out of time, and partially because it's a little difficult to explain. 